Yoni, I've heard you had a brilliant career as a tennis player, <laughs> haven't you? That's true. <laughs> I started at the uh, age uh, 30 years old, and in overall I won three times <laughs> <laughs> before I officially quit. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, uh, you are presenting a uh, talk about uh, uh, testing, so all those tests you will have and none covers message queues. Uh, let's make some noise for Joni Goldberg. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. The fact I chose to speak about this topic it was, is because I was completely clueless a few years ago. Um, so clueless that I gave my customer a bad advice, which can happen, you know, I'm a consultant, sometimes we give bad advices, only this time it led to a production issue. So what happened there? Customer sat in front of me and told me, hey, we need your advice. We need to test our message queue. And the code typically looks like this. We have the internals of our code, the, the, the domain, the, the database, and the message queue libraries. What should we test here exactly? Which scope should we test in these things? And frankly, I had no idea back then. And I start thinking, hmm, well, you should test. And I, I try to buy some time to, to think what might be a good advice here. Then customer looked at me. Okay, so what is your advice? And I was kind of, okay, I think that you should test um, this part, only the internals of the code. Why? Because why bother with the entire message queue thing? Let's just isolate our code, our logic. It should be fine. And it was fine. All the messages flew from the message queue to our code. All were processed correctly. Of course, we tested our code, so everything worked, worked perfectly for a week. And then we started to see, at some point, one message coming at a time that is invalid message. Can happen in message queue, some message that invalid format, which is a regular thing. Our code cut it and threw an exception. And what should have happened is that the code should have, the message queue library should have reject only that malfunctioning message, only one. But what happened in practice is that the Message queue client library rejected all the messages, including good ones. Why? Because it caught, there was something about error handling and how it caught the, the messages, uh, how it caught the errors of the batch, and all of the messages were rejected. And then the system entered a poisoned state where messages were keep flying in, and every time there was one bad message, and all the messages were rejected. Eventually, 20% of system messages were not processed. Day after, the customer looked at me in the eye and should, have, should not need to say even one word. So the lesson learned was that when you test things in isolation and hiding from yourself challenging areas like message queue, you miss a lot of bugs. Then, okay, I learned a lesson, and over the years I tried to do more things. And the next natural stuff, things, was about not mocking anything. Let's do end-to-end -end test. Check the entire thing with the message queue. This should be the right step. And I tried. Surprisingly, it was really hard. So for a start, what we've seen with real message queue is tests start stealing messages from each other. So for example, test one starts, it puts that blue message, then test two puts that gray message. And when the test starts in a multi-process test runner, what we've seen is that the test two takes the message to other tests and vice versa, and it was a complete mess. So we tried, and I tried with multiple customers to, to reach some sane state here. And the next logical step was, OK, let's forget about multi-process. Let's run one process parallel, uh, sorry, sequential, and purge the queue between tests. And even this was surprisingly really hard. So what happened there is that Test one, for example, fails. So all the messages that it handled are being rejected and gets back to the queue. Also, after the test, the test before each, after each test, we ask to purge the queue. But surprisingly, the purge request happens before the messages are getting back to the queue. So what's happening is that after test one ends, there are still messages in the queue. And when test two starts, there are surprisingly messages it consume and never expecting from. 
For this reason, for example, AWS SQS, in their documentation, they state, if you try to purge a queue, we need 60 seconds to, pe to, to clean up the queue. So every test, 60 seconds, it doesn't sound like the right act. So lesson learned is that that message queue layer could be a flaky monster. And uh, testing with message queue is not like database. It's not as easy to separate the data between your tests. I tried two approaches, both failed. And I think that we can frame most testing mistake over this visual. What we see the, uh, on the right side, the blue galaxy, is our need to have great developers' experience, comfort, spin, deterministic stuff. And on the, right, on the left side, we have the our need to make things like production, realistic catch bugs early. So my first attempt to isolate the code was too naive. And the second approach of using a real message queue was too noisy. And what I really need is something there in the middle, a sweet spot. How can we achieve both great developer experience and also something that is realistic? And this is the subject of my talk. How can we make that chaotic topic of testing message queue something sane with great developer experience? So uh, after years, I understood that I need to learn more, right? So I went to YouTube. Surprisingly, no courses on this. Like, everyone's using message queue, everyone's doing testing. No courses, no material in Google except about Java Spring. I'm, I'm not using Spring, sorry. So I went to Amazon, because Amazon has the best search engine in the world. How do I know? The day before, my daughter asked me, hey, I want some equipment that we can catch a bug, and instead of hurting the bug, just take him to, back to nature. I said, no problem. I searched in Amazon, 100 results. We just bought one perfect. Then I said, OK, let's search in Amazon for message queue testing book. The first result was about some webinar from Milano in 2008, which is not about message queue. Second one is about home router. And the third is must <laughs> Like Amazon search engine got completely not. What? Message queue testing? What? Whoa. I never seen Amazon search engine so confused. Um, and this is, this is our goal today. To this, this knowledge does not exist for literature, rather in companies, and I hope to summarize it well today. Before doing it, that a little bit about myself. I'm Yoni. I'm a consultant. I see approximately 20 different teams every year, most of them for testing. I, I usually see a lot of cases uh, in the backend testing world. And I also like very much to craft, to blog, and to summarize the knowledge in few uh, GitHub repositories, and I get a lot of feedback and issues. So everything that I show, will show you went through uh, some cycles of um, enhancements. You can also find all the code examples here and more in my new repository, which is called Node.js Integration Test Practices. Let's start with solution. Um, the system under test that I'll exemplify looks like this. We have a user component microservice, if you will, that fires a user-deleted message. And then some kind of message queue there, uh, propagate it to an order microservice that needs to know that the user was deleted, because we need now to delete all of her orders or modify them. So how would a typical test look like for the order microservice? In this example, when user-deleted message arrives to us, to the order microservice, then we want to delete to ensure that all its all their corresponding orders are deleted. So we start by adding a new order to the system. We need some orders for a start. We need some state. And then we add this order to our database, the order microservice, start a message queue client, and then start a queue subscriber. Like you start your API, you need to start something that listens to the queue. This is the queue subscriber. And the next step, we are ready now to publish a message to the queue and declare that the user was deleted. But now we need to check that the orders are indeed deleted. But when? How do we know that the message, were, that the message was processed? So what many companies are typically doing is using a polar like this. So using, they use some polar libraries that in a busy weight fashion check again and again and again whether the new state is there. In our example, we approach 
the API and check whether the orders are already deleted, not there. If yes, the polar can exit. No, it will busy wait and go again and again and again. So this is not only error prone, it's also very verbose and also slower because what if there is already a failure three seconds ago, the polar will just wait and wait until it timed out. We wish to have better patterns. And after a lot of experiments, what I found to be the same approach for message queue testing is to use a fake message queue and a recorder on top of it, which looks like the following. So a fake is something that replaces the vendor library, right? So we have our code and we approach some vendor library, whether it's Kafka, Rabbit, whatever. But there in the last mile, we are not targeting the vendor library, rather our fake in memory. Which we can code ourselves or use some, something there in the NPM wild. Because it's very, very easy to write one, I want to show you how with um, very short code we can achieve our own fake. The fake has exactly the same signature like your message queue library, Rabbit or, or anything else, and it has a publish method, method consume, Acknowledge, which is like deleting SQS, and reject. Now, I don't like to maintain my old testing infrastructure code, but here we are speaking about less than 30 lines of code. So maybe uh, this is something that is probably better than the alternatives. So let's look, have a look at a very simple, simple implementation. For a start, mo for most of the functions, we don't need to implement anything, rather just fire an event. If the publish function was called, just emit that it was called, that's it. And then for two specific functions, we do need very minor implementation. If the consume function is called, then we are being given a function, a callback to call when there is a message. We just store it locally and resolve. And then if publish is called, the code checks. If there is a callback, if there is a handler, there is a consumer, just call it, just call the function and provide the function and always emit an event. That's it, basically. As simple as this. But then on top of it, you need some convenient layer for the test to report and to give very easy access to all the events that happen. And this is the recorder. So what the recorder is doing, basically, just counting the event and returning them with a promise to the test. For a start, we just initialize all the events that can happen, Right, acknowledgement, publish, subscribe, with the counter set to zero. And then for each event, listen to the message queue, to the fake message queue, subscribe to the event, and if the event happened, just increment the counter. That's it. Overall, I counted 29 lines of code. And then, oh, I think that I'm... Okay, what I, there are some sliding, missing slide here. What I'm missing here is that on top of this, we create a wait function, a wait for event function in, this, in that recorder. So the test can call wait for a specific event, get back a promise which will get resolved only when this event happened. Let me show you. Remember this ugly test with a polar? Let's make it much better now. It's the same test. When user deleted message arrive, you want to delete all the orders, we add a new order to the system. But now, when we initialize the message queue client, we provide the fake provider, the in-memory ones that we have just created. Then we start listening to the fake queue, publish event, and now we need to know when it is ready for assertion. So we call our recorder with this convenient method, wait, and ask, OK, please wait until we get one acknowledgement. In SQS, it's one deletion. In other words, once the code will finish processing the message, it should acknowledge back to the queue, right? We listen to this event, and once it is resolved, with just a simple promise, we know that everything is done. Now we can assert. So we approach the API and ask, OK, give me all the orders of this deleted user, and hopefully, they are all deleted. That's it. And going with this approach, we can test a lot of message queue scenario. One more example, poisoned message, which is just a very nice name for invalid messages. 
So when we have a poisoned message, we want to ensure that our code is not crashing or looping, rather just rejecting, right? Then we declare an invalid message, start the queue, publish that poisoned message, and just assert that it was rejected. And going with this pattern, we can test many, many risks of message queue. Poisoned message, zombie process, which means that the message queue was unable to start and listen, duplication, unordered messages, rejection. Uh, if you're interested in a full checklist of scenarios, you can find, you'll find it here, here in the slides. So that also, we can check most of the risk with this approach. Um, well, before that, I would say that fake, the fake approach is my default because it has great merits. Like, you can test most of the risk very, very quickly in a multi-process multi test runner, uh, and it's quite easy to maintain. It's short. Having said that, there are still some scenarios that cannot be tested with a fake in memory. Those scenario needs real message queue to do some things behind the scene, like retries, move it to the dead letter queue. And for that, you need a real message queue. And to do this, we can... Um, the first thing you'll face, um, before that I should have said, when I'm saying real message queue, what I mean is that Docker image, every reputable product has its equivalent Docker implementation that you can use for your CI or locally. And then the first challenge when testing with a real one would be that, remember, test stealing messages from each other. And after trying many patterns, the best one that I've landed on is a dedicated queue and topic per test. Well, we should write much less tests with real message queue, right? Because we have that fake. But when we need, a dedicated queue is needed. And then we can use the same recorder pattern to reach same testing patterns. Let me show you something that is quite theoretically complex test that I've seen customer implementing with 30 and 40 lines of code, and how it can get sane with the right pattern. So what I want to test and exemplify here is a test with a real message queue that shows that when a message keeps failing and failing and failing, it eventually landing in the dead letter queue. So what we have here is that we start the message queue client, only this time we ask to do it with the real one, not the fake. And then we need some mocking library. Why? Because it's about failing. We need to trigger our code to fail. So I'm using, you can use test double sign on, test whatever, mocking, just make one of your function throw to throw. And then we need a dedicated queue for this test. Otherwise, it will interfere with other tests. So we create a dedicated queue for this test, give it some name. I forgot to add, you should add some random suffix here. Start the queue subscriber which will make the test, as you can see, listen to the both queue, the dead letter queue and the second one. And then we can publish that valid message to the queue. So the test just put a message in the queue. It is awaiting to get a consume event, which consume, consume from the dead letter queue. Next thing, the, queue, the code is fetching the message and trying to process it. Will it succeed? Obviously not, because we have that mocking that will trigger it to fail. What's happening? Message gets back to the queue, right? Then again, queue sends back, code fetches again the message, and it fails again. And again, and again, and again, until the maximum number of retries is arrived. And if our message queue is configured properly, it will end dead letter queue. And this is what our test, the event, is waiting for. And then this will satisfy our test, our assertion will pass, and we will have this test satisfy, which is one of the most complicated flows that you can test in message queue, and as you can see with five, six quite expressive statements. We also, I also benchmarked over the time, what is the price of working with real message queue and creating the dedicated queue per test? And in overall, I found that approximately, after benchmarks for multiple products, the performance overhead of creating a queue per test is approximately 350 milliseconds, which is a small concern, but I think not something dramatic. In overall, I would say that for most of my message queue testing, I would use fake. It's a good one to cover most of the flaws. And only, only when I need more confidence, 
I would also implement a real one and use it sparingly, like in CI, in PR, but not necessarily during coding. Then, now we have 100% of message queue risk covered. Why not? What, 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 for example, is not covered? Ah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, there is one problem here. And if you are a Kafka, Redis, or front-end developer, by now, some of the content was not highly relevant because, um, because, for example, Kafka can do better in separating data and test. But what I'm going, the next problem is highly relevant also for front-end and, and Kafka. So the problem by now is that we worked under the brittle assumption that we know what is the message schema. So for example, our component works, but we assume that the, the message as this is A and B fields. Maybe, but then in production, we meet someone new, someone important, which is the publisher or the consumer if we are in the other side of the, of the road. And um, maybe our publisher believes that there should not be a field B. He sent an email before a month. Didn't you get it? There's no field B anymore. And then you fail in production. And this is known as the contract problem, which I want to show you now how you can mitigate this. So one fair thing to consider is maybe we need end-to-end -end test because we need two parties here, right? The consumer and the publisher. And my ad advice is, hell no, don't consider. This will take you to a world of multi-processes and asynchronicity and, 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 ins and installing infrastructure of someone you don't know. So end-to-end, -end, I think that one of the testing goals is to delay, end -to -end, delay and minimize end-to-end -end as much as you can. So what, yes, I'm going to show three and a half contract techniques that can solve this with your own component in your own developer machine without involving someone else. The first option is just document your messages. There is like Swagger, but for message queue, it is called async API. It's an amazing standard. And maybe someone will read the documentation. It will prevent a production bug. But of course, we need more automated things. So the next option is something that is called Pact, which you can, you can also use for your API if you're front-end and back-end or back-end to back-end. And the idea here is a little bit counterintuitive. The consumer is the one who defines its, the right schema. The consumer defines, hey, this is the JSON that I'm expecting to get. This is the, the payload. And it sends this information to a broker, some kind of cloud service or Docker. And then the publisher, the one that actually fires the message or the API, if, if we're discussing API, grabs this information from the broker and checks whether everything that I have inside internally indeed conforms to these expectations. Let me show you this with code. So this is the consumer code. In our case, it's the order microservice that consumed the message, and I want to define what I'm expecting for. So here I'm calling the packed framework, and I'm defining that the message should have the following content. User ID, deletion date, deletion reason. Okay? All of these fields should be in, in, a, in, a, in a typical message. And then all of these files will be saved automatically locally in my machine. And after some time, I should fire this command packed broker, which means take these files and save them globally in the broker. Probably I'll fire this command in my CI. And also include my version. My or I'm the order microservice. This is version one. And I'm expecting to get this. And then this is how the broker that all parties can look at looks like. What we have here, for every pair of microservices, component or even front-end, you can see for each version whether the contract between the, the parties was verified. Okay? So I'm the order microservice. I just published my expectation for a new schema. Uh, can I deploy my code to production now? Yeah, obviously not, because um, I don't know if the other party even received my, my expectation. So now to the publisher, the user microservice. This, that component should also run its test with Pact. And it looks like the following. With Pact, we define a, 
a minimal configuration that defines, okay, this is my name, I'm the user microservice, and this is the broker URL. This is where we fetch the expectation, the requested schema on re in real time. And then what I'm going to put here is the reality. How do I check that my code in conforms to the schema? Now, I was expecting PAC to do something here like, let's run my code and ensure that everything that I produced indeed conforms to the schema. But I was a little bit disappointed to realize that what they're doing is just asking for your function that factor the message. That's it. Give us your function, and we will check that the message that you generate indeed conforms to what the customer is expecting for. Okay, what if I'm in real in runtime, I will produce something else? They, it won't discover it. So um, I was expecting something else, but I'm presenting Pact, which is a very rep reputable framework as is. And then, when looking at the broker again, you can now see that it was verified. The customer expectation and the providers are met. Can I deploy now? Yes, the consumer. The answer is no, because with contract testing, you need to verify two things. One is the contract, and second is deployment. I mean. You don't know, I don't know whether the, the, the new contract was already deployed to production. And for this reason, I'm going to skip that visual. Um, okay, some, one missing slide here. So one of the cool, coolest part of it is that the publisher can get a command, a CLI command, that can report back to the broker whenever it deploys every version. So if part of your CD, Notify packed, hey, I just deployed version one. And then the part of it is that it will show you these metrics and tell you for every microservice and every version what is in production and whether they can work together. So at the bottom line, you get this really neat feature from Pact. Can I deploy? So now as the user microservice, as I'm deploying my new code, the CD, I can Run this command, it's a verification step, which will check, okay, you're the user microservice, you're about to deploy version one, I know that you are dependent on the other microservice, did I check that your both schemas indeed are aligned and in production? And if yes, it will pass, otherwise it will stop your CD on time. So this is the, the idea of Pact, really synchronized between, between the peers. The third option for contract testing is schema registry, which is a uh, technique that is supported only by Kafka now and Google PubSub. So I'm just going to put it here as a reference because it is not supported yet by um, a lot of tooling, but I definitely should think that it might be a great option uh, very soon. The fourth option is, might surprise you, but I like it a lot, which is NPM, really NPM, the NPM that we know and work with. And how does that work? Here, the publisher creates a pa NPM package with all the typing, type definition of the message. If you're AP it can work the same for API. And then you publish it to NPM as an NPM package. The consumer then grabs it as an additional NPM package and gets IntelliSense and early failure during testing. Let's see an example. So here I'm the publisher, the user microservice, and this is the schema of the user deleted message. The cool part about it, I didn't create anything new. It's the type in my code. I anyway use typing, TypeScript, JS doc, so I need to have a type anyway, right? No, no new work here. And then at some point, I also want to get rid of some specific field, deletion reason. Optionally, if I'd like, I can also include a validating function. Right, you probably have some validation like you're doing for API. Expose it also. Okay. A function that gets a message and tells whether um, it's valid or no. Expose it to the customer. Then you publish to NPM, right? All the schema, only the TypeScript definition file, also the validation function, if you will. You can do the same. You can aggregate both REST API and message queue together in the same package. And then I have one problem, because I just declared what are my expectations for the schema, but the consumer would ask himself, okay, but is this in production yet? Can I use it? I mean, 
is generally what you like, but when? When, were, when are you going to put it in production? So for that, we can use NPM distribution tags. When the user microservice looks at NPM, you can say, oh, this version is production compatible or no. So this is where you flag what is in production now. And then now to the consumer side, which just install this package locally. And before that, we have to consume messages like this. This is, the, this is my testing. I'm trying to publish a message. I'm the consumer. And I have no IntelliSense. So I have to remember and try to do it right. What are the needed fields? But after I, install, I installed the NPM package, I get full IntelliSense. So this is JS doc syntax. I'm importing the type definition. If it's TypeScript, uh, then you just do nothing but import, classic import. And then I'll get full IntelliSense. Not just IntelliSense, my, com my compiler transpiler will fail if I'm trying to refer some non-existing field. And then, as the consumer, this is how my consumption code will look like. I'm trying to get a new message from the queue. This is the message. This is my callback. But now, it's not just plain JSON. There is a type for, for this message. And the validator will try to validate every incoming message like you're doing for APIs. And it will fail fast as appropriate in production. But not only in production, there is also in testing. If you publish a message that is not aligned with the schema, it will fail fast during testing. And this is the nice part about it. You are kind of communicating with some other team, other component, other time zone, but without installation, without live work. Rather, using a very standard mechanism like NPM, and you are synchronizing and aligning yourself asynchronously using a very standard thing like NPM. So to summarize the contract tooling, I would say that Pact is very feature-rich and robust. On the other end, there is a learning curve here, and uh, not everything will feel to you like convenient with great developer's experience. So I would use it when there is a really integration with higher cost of mistake. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have the async API documentation, which I would use for very lightweight integration. Schema registry is another option, emerging option, which time will tell how uh, useful it is. And there in the middle, the sweet spot, I think, that NPM contract, using NPM for contracting thing, whether it's a secure API, is really the, the great balance between developer's experience and, and, and doing the thing. So to summarize over that visual, I would say that the techniques that really it's a great balance, and I would highly I found to be those that really brought sanity to my message queue testing are a fake message queue and NPM, simple and, and, and very useful. And in overall, I believe that the art in, of modern testing in overall is just to find this sweet spot there in the middle. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Yoni. Is there any question in the room? Otherwise, I will ask something to you. We are pretty on time, but okay. Uh, there, there is a question from Hoping. I can ask something in while. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I want to ask you, uh, when um, would you use Pact? When would I use Pact? Yeah. Um, well, a small story, I had some project in US when we, we were the API provider and the consumer not only complained, but rather the legal department started sending mails, you're broken the API and it's causing a lot of, there are financial consequences. So whenever you really need to have some very robust uh, verification, including like the customer signing on every schema, I would surely use something like Pact that make it very official. 
Uh, and I would use it in, in, in general only when there is a really complicated um, integration when every mistake really uh, costs a lot. Okay. Thanks. Um, which products already implement this packed pattern? Come again? Which product mm -hmm. already implement this packed pattern? Which products? Yep. Um, which one? Packed itself, yeah, that, <laughs> that's sensible. Um, I'm not familiar with kind of commercial, I mean, uh, some of my customers use it, but they are not known products, so I don't have any, any useful reference. Um, you won't find it, obviously, in NPM packages, all the NPM packages that we know, because it means for integration, so um, I don't have any useful reference for it. Okay, hi. Uh, first of all, great talk, uh, really insightful. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, in your strategy on uh, publishing the schema as an NPM package, how do you manage uh, different versions of schema, uh, regardless of technology? I mean, if my client uh, uses, uh, I don't know, uh, JavaScript, but my server uses uh, Python or whatever other language, uh, how do you manage uh, different uh, dependency uh, management of your schema? Yeah, well, obviously in that case, NPM is probably not your best choice because NPM is a JavaScript thing. In that case, I would consider options like schema registry, if you are Kafka or Google PubSub, because they are language agnostic. Uh, they are also supporting protocols which are inherently language agnostic, like Protobuf and um, one else that I forgot its name now. Um, so this is one, if, if, you're, if you're working with this product, it's one good option. Um, in that case, I would also consider something like Protobuf or anything that was designed to be, you know, uh, to, to messaging across uh, different platforms. Less, yeah. less pa more pain for you, but probably no, no choice in this case. Thanks. No more question. Okay, thank you, Yoni. Thank you. It was a pleasure.